Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I moved to Montana for this kind of weather. And I kind of laugh because all my friends in all the other different states, you know, oh goodness, it's 30 degrees, it's freezing. It's cold. I have friends in Oklahoma that I think they, their schools have been closed four days so far this year for one inch of snow. <laughs> but for the threat of one inch of snow, <laughs> they, they closed. And uh, I think they're rather silly. This is what I live for. <laughs> um, but you know, snow does, snow does leave us with a bit of a dilemma um, because we do have people in the church that can't shovel themselves out. So I would kind of prompt you to remember those that, that don't have the uh, ability to get out and shovel a lot of snow. I know uh, Ted was out shoveling snow this morning, so we need to maybe get some people over there and, and finish getting them shoveled out. Uh, Vivian did get shoveled out. The Mormons beat us. Also, the wood moved. To the oh, okay. So they just need it restocked. Yeah. From the pile. Okay. Okay. So we need a couple people. You, you said you're going over. Okay. Talk to Dave about getting over there and, and helping Ted get this stuff. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and share uh, the latest report on Mary Lou. Uh, surgery was Tuesday. The surgery went really well, except for a slight little nick with the something. <laughs> and they had to fix not only the original problem, but the one they caused. But uh, she came out of it very well. Uh, Christian, I got to see her. Uh, she came out about 1240, and we saw her about an hour later, about 140. And she looked really good. Um, she had her eyes closed, but she was nodding and, and shaking her head. And she reached out and grabbed my hand and squeezed my hand. And um, uh, Tuesday, they had the surgery. Uh, she was in ICU overnight. Wednesday, they moved her to a regular room and actually had her up walking. We went back up and visited her Thursday, and she's doing laps. Oh, wow. uh, she did a lap, and the lady said, okay, you want to go stand? She said, no, I'm good for some more. So she did another half a lap and came back. Uh, Ted got to the room and said, I'm done. And he let her go off, and he went in, and he and I went in and talked. Um, she is supposed to come home tomorrow. Is that right? Okay. There was thought she might come home today, but she... Actually, um, Thursday night, she had a rough night. Uh, the anesthesia and some of the medication gave her an upset stomach, and, and she had some vomiting. But uh, that eased off a little bit on Friday. I guess it didn't ease off all the way until yesterday. Um, but uh, she wanted to come, of course, Mary Lou being Mary Lou, she wanted to come home Saturday. Uh, the doctor told her no. You want to come home Sunday? No. Let's see about Monday. Report is now she'll be coming home tomorrow. Uh, she's doing very well. Uh, hold on to your boots, because Mary Lou will be unleashed. <laughs> I told Dennis, she's going to want to start wallpapering. So, if any of you have anything that needs to be wallpapered, talk to Mary Lou. Um, I have asked uh, Dave and Shelly if they would be willing to share their testimony. Uh, I believe today Shelly's doing it. So then next week, pending, they can get down. Dave will do it. That much more important that you give it. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Shelly and let her share with us what God has done for her. Given my testimony several times, but mostly in writing, never really, never in front of a lot of people. So I have photographs of some of the people in my stories. If anybody wants to see them after the service, you're welcome to come over and ask me for them. Um, I wrote it up just for my sake, but I pretty much got it, you know, got it down. But uh, I uh, was raised in a Christian home, and but I didn't get saved until I was in my 40s at this church. And um, I, I'm really thankful God had a lot of patience for me and still does 
and I'm thankful for my parents' prayers because I don't know where I'd be. I'd probably be dead in, in hell otherwise. <laughs> but um, there was a lot of things that happened in my life that shook me up and it finally brought me to faith and, and brought me to where I was. Um, the first one was when I was 13 years old. My parents started attending this church called the House of Prayer. It was a Pentecostal, it was a black Pentecostal church is what it was, but the white people started going to it. So when I attended, it was a mixed racial church. The, the um, pastor was white and his wife was black, which helped the mixed congregation kind of, it kind of eased things over between the two races. I think it made things better. But uh, when the past, we called him Brother Hunt, he didn't go by pastor, and uh, while he was ministering there, the Spirit of God was really moving in that church, and the gifts of the spirits were actively um, being used a lot, and uh, it was pretty impressive as uh, a kid seeing some of the stuff that happened in that church, and um, I was very fortunate. Um, Brother Hunt, one morning, my mom said he used to pray like for two hours before the service. I didn't know that till later. She told me that. But um, one morning he gave a sermon. And uh, the sermon, all I can remember is 13. He did, he did a sermon about um, uh, doubting Thomas and how he had to see the nail prints in Jesus' hands and he had to actually touch them and feel the nail prints before he could believe in God. And how we shouldn't be unbelieving, be doubting Thomases. And um, he was just so full of the Holy Spirit when he gave that sermon. And he was just, uh, I was only 13, and I knew I'd probably break with this one. This one is really hard for me, because it was kind of sad, too. Um, I was only 13 years old, but I could see the evidence of the Holy Spirit on him. On him. It was so powerful, it was almost like he radiated. And um, at the time, they had this big painting or mural on the back of that church wall. It was like, uh, I don't know, it went from the top of the ceiling all the way down, and it was the baptism of Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit descending on him. And that just kind of added to the effect. And I was just so touched um, by his sermon and, and just, what, just seeing that, I could just, that evidence of the Holy Spirit in him. Um, I couldn't stop thinking about it. And so the next day, I went to church camp on the Oregon coast. Um, my parents, had, we had already arranged that. I was supposed to meet my friend Cindy in that story and pick her up on the way. We, used, we had just moved um, from Swenson, Oregon. So my, the church we used to go was, to a, was a French church, a Quaker church. So I was going to the Quaker church camp and meeting up with my friend Cindy. And we were both going there. And that happened like the day after. We left the morning, that Monday morning. My parents took me there. And I, but I couldn't quit thinking about that sermon on Sunday and Brother Hunt. And it just wouldn't leave my mind. So as soon as we got to camp, I found my room and I wrote him a letter. And I told him how touched I was by his sermon and how the presence of the Holy Spirit was so strong on him. And I just really noticed that. And I couldn't wait to mail the letter to him, to thank him. And so I dropped it in the camp mailbox. And uh, that day, I think it went out Monday afternoon. And uh, at the end of the week, my parents came to pick me up from church camp with my friend Cindy. And they had Pastor Hunt's two boys in the back seat of their car. <clears throat> and I knew this was where I was going to choke. Um, I always do. They were 9 and 11 at the time. Um, their own sugar. And they didn't really say anything to me um, until we, we stopped at Cannon Beach on the way home. And we all got out and I played with their own sugar and we ran on the beach. And, and then my parents pulled me off the side, side and they talked to me and they told me what happened. It was that apparently the day after his sermon, he he had cancer and I didn't know it. And he, he went into the hospital the day after that sermon. And uh, he, was, he got my letter sometime during that week. 
And um, it touched him so much that he started witnessing to everybody in the hospital that he could reach. And uh, just telling his story and witnessing to anybody he could, he, he was able to touch. And um, so I guess my parents were just offered Lou to take care of their two boys that day, so they brought him with me. Well, Pastor Hunt died about two or three weeks after that. That was his last sermon. Um, the next one, the next really powerful thing that happened in my life was the same church, the Pentecostal church. I was 14 years old, and my mom, I have an older sister and an older brother, and then I was the youngest in the family. And my mom got pregnant again. <laughs> and she was 38 years old, and she had had some minor female complications, nothing like really serious. <clears throat> But uh, she hadn't told us kids yet. She just found out that she was pregnant. She didn't say anything to us. Um, the only person she had told at all was my dad. She hadn't told anybody at the church or any of her friends. And uh, she went to get one of her early prenatal checkups. And the doctor told her to get an abortion. And uh, that doctor, we found out later, was a pro-abortion doctor. They actually had a news article in the Daily News one a pro-abortion doctor, a non-pro-abortion doctor, and he was on the front page of the Daily News for pro-abortion. Um, he didn't really have a lot to go on. He, uh, there wasn't, he didn't do any tests or any thorough research before he told her to get an abortion. There wasn't any solid evidence of why she should get an abortion. And, uh, but anyway, she didn't tell anybody but my dad. And the next Sunday we went to church and there was a lady in that congregation, her name was Billy, and she had the spiritual gift of prophecy. And uh, after the singing was over, when we all got done singing, uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, she stood up and she just said, God hates abortion. And all the people in that church, they were mostly elderly ladies. None of the, hardly any of the ladies in that church were of age that they could have had a child. They were mostly in menopause. <laughs> there were maybe only two other women it could have possibly have been, you know, and, and it wasn't them. And my mom knew this, and I don't know why she didn't tell Billy that morning what had happened to her. But she didn't. She just kept it to herself for some reason. And um, two weeks later, we went to church, same church, and um, they did an altar call. And my mom went forward for the altar call, and um, another woman in her, that church, her, a black woman by the name of Basti, um, felt led to pray for mom. And she, she felt like she should put her hand on her stomach for some reason, and she didn't know why. So she started praying for my mom, and then she just started weeping and praying and weeping and praying. And um, it wasn't until later on my mom finally told these two ladies what had happened and what the doctor told her after she started showing it she was obviously <coughs> pregnant. Um, so my mom uh, gave birth to my sister Julie. No birth complications, no problems, nothing, nothing wrong with the delivery whatsoever. Today, my sister has two beautiful little boys. One's about to turn five, the other one turns two this month. Um, she's an attorney. Uh, she supports, uh, she's a defense attorney for women and children who are in domestic abuse situations, and, so, and also immigration uh, situations. She kind of deals with. Um, she was on the news in Bakersfield, California, uh, uh, just, I think it was December, for a fundraiser for a woman's shelter for uh, women in domestic abuse situations. Her husband just recently graduated from Fuller Seminary School, and uh, I'd say God had her hand, his hand on her. So that was pretty, pretty, pretty cool. Um, one other thing, Another really an incident that happened in my life that really affected me later on um, was this elderly couple that I met. Um, just after the first time I moved away from home from my family's house, uh, 
I work for this, uh, this guy, uh, Daryl Radcliffe, at a state park in near Vancouver, Washington. And I did, I, I was a good worker and he liked me, so he hired, he got a job transfer up to the San Juan Islands in northern Washington and on Orcas Island. And he, he told me to apply that he'd hire me. <laughs> so, so I ended up on Orcas Island working for RAD and during that summer, um, I got to know them a lot better. We got really close. Um, Edna had two sons. She was older, but she had had two sons and never a daughter. So she, I was kind of like the daughter that she never had. And so I kind of latched on to them and they latched on to me. And I spent a lot of time at their house on the weekends and the evenings. And, and uh, she, uh, one day I was at their house and Edna broke out and she told me her story. <laughs> um, Edna, when she was, when her boys were teenagers in high school, they were both, I think they were like 14, 15 years old. Um, her husband was in the Marine Corps and they lived on a military base. And uh, they, uh, Edna wasn't feeling well. There was something wrong with her. She didn't feel good. So she told her husband and she went to the doctor on the base and he couldn't find anything wrong with her. And so she went home. But this kept happening. She kept saying, no, I still don't feel good again. There's something wrong. And so she would go back to the doctor. And he said, I can't find anything. It doesn't seem to be anything wrong. So she'd come home, and this happened again and again and again. Finally, the doctor kind of got insulting at her. He says, you know, some women just like to see doctors, you know. He just started making this and, you know, doubting her and kind of making fun of her even. And, and Rad knew that Edna wasn't really a complainer type. And if there was something wrong, there really was. If she was saying there was something wrong, there was really something wrong. And he just wasn't finding it. So finally, he decided he was going to take her off the military base and he was going to take her to a specialist. So he did. And the first day they went to the specialist, the, the doctor found cancer. And uh, so he put her on chemotherapy immediately. It didn't waste any time because it, it already spread. And uh, it wasn't too long after that, and I ended up in the hospital with an IV in her and hooked up to monitors. Um, she flatlined in the hospital, and she said during that time when she her heart flatlined, she saw a really bright light. But, and Edna was a believer, um, and and that's all she said she saw. And then she, I guess she regained consciousness and she came out of it. And uh, I knew Edna about 20 years after that, and she had no cancer, no sign of cancer at all. And, uh, in fact, she died of something else later on. She never died of cancer. So, anyway. Um, those were the three things in my life that really stood out to me. But, unfortunately, God was really working on me, but I wasn't saved at this point. I was still, you know, I, was a, I thought I was a Christian. I didn't really understand salvation. I, I, I guess I thought I was... I didn't know if I was saved or not. I thought maybe I was. But um, the next turn of my life went really bad. <laughs> I, um, I graduated from a community college and then I was ready to go on to a, or a four year college. And I went to Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon. And I only knew one person in the whole town. I didn't know anybody that lived there at all. And I, I went there because there was the school to go to for forestry, and I wanted to get into forestry. So um, I made a mistake. It was big, some big mistakes. Uh, I didn't find a church and a fellowship when I moved there. And I quit reading my Bible. And I wasn't saved. And in a university environment, that was not, not a wise, wise decision. All the friends... The friends I was hanging around, um, I chose friends from the college. They like to do all the fun things that I like to do. They like to rock climb and cross country ski and, and go running. And, and I chose them for those reasons instead of their belief in God. And those are the ones I hung out with the most. They also happen to be pretty liberal. <laughs> 
And it wasn't too many years of that situation that I started heading down the wrong road. And I even started doubting my Christian, my parents, uh, my Christian faith. I wasn't sure. I was being challenged that what about all these other religions? Um, what are they going to heaven? Um, you know, the New Age movement. There's all these things out there, and I wasn't. I wasn't stable. I wasn't solid. I didn't really know for sure if there was just one God and one way to heaven. I was starting to doubt it, and um, I kind of fell in with you know, some of the ideas of my friends, and I fell into sin, and I moved in with my boyfriend, and he was a pot smoker, and at the time I was trying to be really open-minded and accepting of his lifestyle, it's like, oh, so, you know, that's his thing, that's okay, that's cool, as long as it doesn't affect me, but, um, we moved in together, and two years after the relationship, um, he was smoking more pot, and more pot, <laughs> By the third year of the relationship, we had a marijuana growing operation in our backyard. And it was a pretty good size one. Um, and I guess it was pretty stupid of me. I, at this time, I was pretty attached to him. It was hard to leave. And I was not being very smart. But my parents, I never told my parents what was going on. I never told them about the growing operation. They had no idea. I kept it a secret from them. But my, they didn't approve of my relationship with Joe, and they had been praying for me and praying for me and praying for me, especially my mom. And uh, one morning, my mom went to her ladies' Bible study at her church, and she felt led by the Spirit to pray for me. And so she asked the pastor's wife to, if the ladies would all pray for me. And so the pastor's wife, whose name was Shelly, <laughs> um, put, put her hands on my mom, and they all prayed for me. Well, during that week, a guy showed up. I don't even know who he was. Never met him before until then. And uh, he said he drove down from Junction City. And he showed up in the driveway of our ha at our house. And he, he asked me if Joe and Pete were around. I said, no, they're, they're not here right now. He said, well, I want to talk to you. He says, um, about this marijuana growing operation, if, and he said, we get busted. So I think he might have been a business partner in the deal, but I really don't know. He says, if, if, if we get busted, you'll be an accomplice to the crime. And I guess uh, I hadn't really thought about that seriously. I was thinking Joe was trying to tell us because Pete owned the property and he bought the property, and he, he had the grow operation um, that me and Joe were just renters on the land, and that was somehow we were off the hook. They were trying to convince me that we wouldn't get in trouble, that we'd just say, oh, we're renters, and we didn't, you know, we're going to play dumb or something. But he, he laid it out for me straight and says, if, if they get busted, you're going to be charged as an accomplice to the crime. And he says, uh, I found out later that it would have been a felony. So... Um, Anyway, so it shook me up pretty bad because I think I was just I was just kind of going along, being oblivious and stupid, and this guy just uh, woke me up a bit, <laughs> and it scared me pretty bad because I didn't think of I thought I I, I don't know what I thought, but um, I realized the seriousness of what I just got myself into, and I called my mom by the end of that week and asked her for some money to move out. And um, so I moved into a place by myself closer to where I was working at the time because I was working in another town um, near there and I was just driving to my job. And uh, I paid my parents back within a month and because I, I, don't, I don't like to take advantage of my parents uh, money-wise. And um, then I, that summer they had told us um, my job was running out. They, they laid us off. I was a firefighter for the Alsea Ranger District on the Saw National Forest, and they were eliminating the fire crew. So they kind of told everybody, if you want to continue in fire, that maybe you should apply for some hotshot jobs, the hotshot fire crews. And so I applied to several, but the one I first got contacted 
with was uh, with the Alpine Hotshot Crew in U uh, Utah. And since they were the first ones that contacted me, I didn't think I should pass up the chance in case the other ones didn't turn out. And also I thought, it's probably a good way for me to get away from Joe so I don't move back in with him because I knew I might, I knew I'd be tempted to. And so I took the job in Utah and uh, I was on the crew for five years. And uh, hotshot crews travel around the United States and fight fires kind of everywhere. That's their primary purpose. So they go to a lot of the really large, large fires. And uh, during that time, I had a few close. We I had a few close calls. And one summer, I had a lot of bad luck with helicopters. And I had a couple of helicopter accidents right near me. That, um, and then we were on a fire in. Uh, the Salmon River breaks of Idaho, and it was, uh, we were on this, uh, we were on top of this ridge and there was this steep hill below us, and we didn't, our foreman wasn't really doing his job as a lookout, and he wasn't paying attention, and we kind of got short notice that the fire was starting to burn up the hill at us, and we were up here and the fire was coming up at us uh, on a steep incline. So we had to take a run for it, and uh, with some radio calls, we kind of figured out where to go. We were kind of scrambling, but we counted heads and we all made it out of there. And then in 1994, we went to uh, um, Rabbit Creek Fire. It was on the Sawtooth Nash, uh, Saw Boise National Forest in the Sawtooth Wilderness area, and it was 164,000 acres. And I think it was about 100,000 acres when we showed up for the fire. And again, we were burning, we were digging a fire line on the tops of the ridges. There was about, I think, nine or ten crews up on top of the ridges. And the fire behavior picked up, the humidities dropped. Um, it was severe fire danger at that time. The humidities were extremely low. And the temperatures were, I don't know, they were 90s or 100s, something like that. It was hot. And uh, the winds, we were predicting like 40 to 50 mile per hour winds on it. And the fire was already like 100,000 acres when we got there. So it was ready to romp. It was ready to take off. And uh, so they called all the crews down off the ridge tops. And they told us to get down to the ground, to the airstrip that was down below. And, you know, Idaho's steep country and it's, it was probably a mile or two getting down to the bottom to the airstrip. But we had one crew that was in really poor physical shape. So they were having problems getting down off the hill. We, everybody was down except for this one crew. We were waiting to do the back burn and get the safety zone ready before the fire swept through there. And, and um, the, our operations foreman called their crew and said, you need to drop your packs and your tools and just leave your fire shelter attached to your belt and get down there here as quickly and safely as you can. Because we were waiting to do the burnout operation because we were waiting for them to get down. And uh, so finally they, they got down to the airstrip and we counted, all our, counted their heads and we gave the signal to the Grito hotshots to start the back burn as soon as they set foot on the ground in the airstrip. And, uh, <laughs> They blackened out the airstrip just in the nick of the time, and it was like a, it was a running crown fire through Lodgepole, so it was a complete stand replacement fire. <laughs> and it burned up, it torched out all the trees around us. Came through there like a freight train, and burned up everything for miles in either direction. And the only thing left standing was this wooden building. All our supplies, uh, the fire tool supplies were all burned up. <laughs> And, but they had foamed down this wooden building, and uh, it made it through there miraculously because there was uh, diesel cans exploding into the air, flying above the roof of the church and stuff. It was crazy, but uh, somehow that that wooden building didn't burn up. <laughs> the, their foaming was enough, that, and at the time I thought it was a church. It was an old, I found out later it was an old Grange Hall is what it was um, for the mining town of Graham. 
uh, which burned up. What, whatever was left of ground burned up. But uh, I thought it was a church, so I sort of added to the effect, <laughs> and it really convicted me. And I, I knew my life was a mess, and um, and. It, it got me, you know, after that, I was just thinking, you know, you never know whether you're going to live to see tomorrow. You really don't know if there's another day for you. Um, you could go at any time, and especially with an occupation like firefighting, it, you know, that's a reality. And um, I, I guess it's a reality for everybody, but it really hit home, and that's when I started coming to this church was after that. I started wanting to come more regularly. And uh, my faith in God was had started to blossom. I was starting to believe that, you know, I, I thought back, I was really thinking hard about that minister who was filled with the Holy Spirit. That one just stood out in my mind so strong. And everything I've seen in college, I, I just wasn't seeing anything like the evidence of the Holy Spirit that I've seen in my life. I hadn't seen, I wasn't seeing anything extraordinary. I wasn't seeing miracles happening. I, I just didn't see that presence of the Holy Spirit. So it was really the presence of the Holy Spirit and the workings of the Holy Spirit that made me believe in God. Um, and so my faith was there but there were still parts missing. And um, Pastor Kelly McCormick, who was here before, um, gave a sermon kind of outlining the elements of salvation. And, and he was talking several sermons about how to get saved. Um, but he mentioned the key point that was missing for me, and that was repentance. And um, sometimes when we grow up in a Christian church, we think we're good or something when we're not, and and it's really important to come to God with a repentant heart and admit your sins, and that's really part of the salvation thing. It's not just the faith. It's not just that you have faith in God, but it's also that you got to repent and say, "I'm a sinner. I need your, I need your salvation. I need you." And I I went home. And I was walking along the Locksaw River, and um, I had said a prayer of salvation, repented of my sins, and I can't even tell you the formula. I, I think that it doesn't, doesn't really matter. I didn't know a piece of paper to read off of or anything. I just, it was just my own words, but it was in my own heart. And I think the importance in salvation, it says, you believe in, in your heart and you profess God, and you believe that God raised him from the dead, and you believe he is the one way. And I had finally come to that point where I believed he was the one God and the one way. And I had the faith and I had the belief now that I didn't have before. And then I, I had the awareness that I needed to repent, and it all came together. And I finally got saved. And I knew I wasn't saved before because when I got saved, when I said it, the Holy Spirit came on me so strong that it was like, wow, it was incredible. And I was like, okay, and now I know I wasn't saved before. I just thought I was because it was so different. I, I had seen the Holy Spirit's work in churches. I had seen other people. I've seen miracles happen, but I didn't have it personally. It never happened to me personally. And so um, I was really wounded when I came to the Lord. And so, for some reason, God just gave me, like, an extra dose of the Holy Spirit. It was pretty, it was pretty awesome. It was, like, it was incredible. <laughs> it only lasts, I mean, that, that really strong presence of the Holy, Holy Spirit only lasts about a couple months. But it, it kind of carried me through in a time when I really needed His help. I needed to be carried. I needed help. And um, I could get... I could figure out how to get in the presence of the Holy Spirit when I needed it, and it just would come on so strong. It was like being in some kind of protective bubble. It was amazing. It was incredible. And I never felt anything like that before. So I knew I was saved. Anyway, that's, that's my testimony. <laughs>
That, I think, perfectly describes America. You know, we have so many people in America that are cultural Christians. Oh, I grew up in the church. You know, my mom and dad go to church, and grandma and grandpa go to church, and we have this mentality that, that uh, you know, you walk in the door a certain number of times and point you're a Christian. And if that's the case, then there's a lot of people sitting out here that are Big Macs. <laughs> because you walk into McDonald's quite a bit. And, and quite honestly, um, America is in trouble. And I, I think our culture is in trouble. Because we have a lot of people that think they're okay with God when in reality they're enemies of God. He looks at them as an enemy. He is opposed to them. He resists them. And they think they're okay. And there will come a day when, when they'll stand before him and he'll say, depart from me, I don't know you. But God, I, I went to the First Baptist Church or to the Fundamentalist Church or to the Pentecostal Church and I always sat in the same chair in the same spot and remember me, I always raised my hands on the second song. And God says, I, I don't know you. And uh, that's a dilemma because you know, when, when Shelley was describing all the events up to her salvation, that's the stuff we see, that's the stuff that we expect. But, but at the moment of salvation, she realized then what she was missing before. You, know, you can't really understand until you come on to this side of salvation what it's like if you don't have it. You just go through the motions. You go through saying, oh yeah, I, I read my Bible, I pray, I hang out with Christians sometimes, you know, and, and we start to rationalize all the steps that we think makes a Christian, and, and none of those make a Christian. Mm -hmm. Because there's only one way, and that's through, like, like Shelley said, I mean, the first thing we need to do is there needs to be confession. What is confession? I mean, we use all these churchy words, but let's, let's put them into everyday English. What is confession? Confession just means you agree. Okay, God, I agree. You're right. I'm wrong. Okay? That's confession. Okay? I blew it. This is where I blew it. I'm a sinner. You're right. I'm a sinner. I have offended you. I have resisted you. I have opposed you. You're right. I'm wrong. Then there's repentance. What, what, what is repentance? Repentance isn't just feeling sorry. Gosh, I feel really bad that I said that word. I want to explain today. That, that's not repentance. Okay? Repentance literally means to turn away from. So, this is what we're doing. And we repent, we turn away from it. We're not doing it anymore. Okay, that's, that's repentance. We have to have confession. We have to agree with God. And then, but that's not enough. There has to be repentance. There has to be a turning away. If your life is the same after your salvation, as it was before your salvation, there was no salvation. There may have been an emotional moment. There may have been a heartfelt moment. There may have been tears. But there was no salvation. So there's got to be repentance. And there's got to be confession. But what drives both of those? What drives both of those is faith. And, and she even made the comment about doubting Thomas. You know, I think Thomas gets a, a bad rap. Because none of the disciples believed. Remember? The women came in and said, He's risen! He's alive! And they said, early in the morning. Why don't you go pick something to eat? You know. None of them believed. And then Jesus appeared in their midst, and they went, <laughs> and the women were going, see, told you. <laughs> yeah, now you go cook. <laughs> <laughs> see, there's got to be faith that drives it. There has to be a belief. Okay? Because when Jesus talked to Thomas, he said, you believe because you've seen, but blessed are those who believe without seeing. That's us. That's us. That's you and me. That's, that's the really cool thing about us. We're blessed because we believe without seeing. Now, here's the really cool thing about this. This is what makes it absolutely amazing. God will even give you the belief. God will even give you the faith. 
God will reach down and give you what you need for salvation. Not only did he come to the cross, but he sent his spirit into the world. Why? To convict the world of sin. Oh, okay. Now I know I'm a sinner. I know there's something wrong. That's God's spirit. To lead us to repentance so that we'll turn away from what we're doing wrong. Right? He's given us everything that we need. Absolutely everything that we need. So, Shelly, thank you very much for sharing that. Um, I think that's a challenge to everybody sitting here to re-examine. Okay? If your life isn't changed, then there was no salvation. And, I, I, and, and I'm going to qualify that because there are some people that get saved and there are certain things that change. Like church attendance might go up. But the life that you lead doesn't significantly change. What you are inside doesn't change. You don't have the refreshing of God's Spirit in you. Okay? You're not sealed with His Spirit. You still look at the Scriptures and, and you just go, I don't get it. It's a mystery. That was one of the things that uh, I remember Scott Edmund sharing when, when he was... He was attending church. He attended here for, what, 11, 12 years before he came to know the Lord. And he was saying that he would read the Word and he just, he just didn't get it. And I remember that. Reading it and going, okay, I get the part about the rock and the giant. All right, I got that. But what's all this New Testament stuff? And uh, all of that, I, I don't get it. Well, God's Spirit gives us the understanding also. Okay, He's the teacher. He's the counselor. So, thank you. Uh, next week, Dave is on, pending he can get here. Are you supposed to follow up? We're giving you a week to think of it. <laughs> and that's the cool thing, because every story is about salvation. You know, I mean, we're all, we were all stuck in the pit. We were all separated eternally from God, and he reached across the infinity of that separation and saved us. That's, that's the cool part about it. We, we tend to get caught up in the yuck of the former life. And we tend to be excited and, and titillated about the people that, um, oh, well, I was a drug addict, and oh, I was a, a gang member, and oh, I killed people. And we get excited about those, but their salvation is no more real than mine. My salvation is every bit as dramatic as theirs, because I was a sinner separated for eternity from God. And he saved me. That's what makes salvation. Okay?